to New World next week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. White collar robots are taking yuppie jobs too. We've got that story plus rules for moon travel, but first we go to Florida. Media Monarchy and Corbett Report have reported on Orlando all week and will include links to those reports. But for now, we'll leave that story where it is and cover some different stories on this New World Next Week. Florida attorney says growing vegetables not a fundamental right. A local controversy is brewing in South Florida surrounding yet another instance of local governments imposing fines on residents and persecuting them over having gardens on their property. After living in Miami Shores for 17 years and growing veggies in their front yard for the same amount of time, Tom Carroll and Hermine Ricketts were forced to dig up their garden in front of their home in 2014. That was a few months after the Miami Shores Village Council passed a new zoning plan, meaning that low-level bureaucrats wasted no time in fanning out among the residential areas to uproot the violators. The couple is now suing on grounds that the ban on front yard gardens violates the Florida Constitution by imposing improper limits on private property rights as well as violating the Equal Protection Clause. The couple's being represented by lawyers with Institute for Justice, a libertarian nonprofit. I've got an archive on MediaMonarchy.com going back seven, eight years using the tag of urban food. And it's a discussion where every other article is either community going after people having gardens or another community overturn the law to say that they can grow gardens. And there again are articles going back years and years and years noting that the urban food revolution has exploded. And fortunately, like a lot of things that are helping us and not helping the powers that shouldn't be, it's kind of another case of once the toothpaste is out of the tube, there's no way to stop it. And as more the phony baloney economy collapses, more people are just going to do it. And this, in a lot of ways, is that sort of nullification. Yes, yes. Nullification for the people. And this is something I've been thinking about recently. The difference between the mindset of people 50 years ago, 100 years ago, where you read about strikes and direct action and people being non-compliant with laws that are clearly atrociously ridiculous. And today, where the closest we can get to that is some kind of Occupy movement that's going to par- uh, camp in a park and wait there until something? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, what what are they doing? No, this is the type of direct action that people should be involved in. If your local city council or whatever is trying to pass some ridiculous, bogus law that you can't grow vegetables in your front yard, or you can't collect rainwater on your own property, or you can't go and feed the homeless, or other ridiculous laws like this, Every single person in that area should be breaking those laws. They do not apply. They do not have force if you do not allow them to enforce those laws. And these are the types of things that no one can disagree with. No one can get angry about, oh my god, he's growing tomatoes in his front yard. It's so ridiculous. And every time people just lay down and submit to stupid laws like this, they are enslaving themselves. And every time they stand up and resist something even as simple as this, they are flexing that muscle and getting a little bit stronger each time and getting it into their heads that they do not have to comply with laws that are self evidently ridiculous so my if anyone in that area is listening to this please start (laughs) growing vegetables we usually mention it towards the end of these episodes the good news next week spinoff that i started doing earlier this year the latest episode of good news next week is gardening more powerful than presidents it's that story on activist post about it gets at the kind of idea the fundamental truth of Growing a garden is going to give you more satisfaction this fall than holding your nose and voting for, again, some phony baloney powers that shouldn't be. Shall we move to story number two? Let's do it. And here come the robots. Meet Betty the robot, the perfect office manager. A transportation company in the town of Milton Keynes in the UK has recruited a new trainee office manager in the form of a robot called Betty. Bug-eyed looking Betty will carry out tasks including patrolling the offices, collating data on clutter and noise, and checking fire doors and checking fire doors are closed and desks are clear. She'll be tasked with greeting guests at reception when visitors come to see the catapult's famous driverless pod cars. 
Betty is a highly sophisticated robot running artificial intelligence-driven software developed by an international research team led by, there's so many buzzwords in that paragraph, <laughs> led by the University of Birmingham. Betty is part of the 7.2 million pound EU-funded STRANDS project, that's S-T-R-A-N-D-S, where robots are learning how to act intelligently and independently in real-world environments while understanding 3D space and how this changes over time from milliseconds to months. There's been lots of talk about how robots are going to take the low-end, greasy jobs at Fast Food Nation. But we talked about when the Davos conference was going on earlier this year in January, they kind of chucked the idea of the Davos man and just rolled out the idea of Davos robots. So it might not just be the, the kids at Wendy's. <laughs> yeah, no, it might not. So say it with me, James, and I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. Uh, yeah, you're right. There has been a lot of talk about this idea, this year specifically, but obviously in recent years, but really it's ratcheting up right now. And how many different stories like this can we name just from the past several months? There's the Davos uh, story. It was on the Davos agenda, the replacement of human workers. And uh, it was uh, it's in Wendy's or McDonald's or wherever else. They're all starting to do automated um, ordering. It's uh, stories like this one. Um, we can throw in the Adidas uh, moving uh, factories back to Germany story. Oh, with the catch, oh, it's going to be robot workers in the factories. So um, whatever, whether this is a coordinated news agenda to promote this as the next big idea or just a reflection of the coming reality in the economy, it is coming. Robotization, automation of almost every aspect of the productive manual industrial economy is coming. And this is a story that really is an inflection point for humanity. Historians of the future will be writing the story of this era either as the time when we freed ourselves from the chains of manual physical drudgery and freed human productivity to start, you know, doing all the things that people actually want to do instead of going to a slave job for eight hours a day, five days a week and doing life-depriving, boring stuff, or it will be the story of, oh, and then the depopulation started. So I don't know if there is a happy ending for this, given this, the power structure that exists today, given the top-down oligarchical control that already exists over this system. They clearly don't need the mass of humanity anymore, and as Brzezinski loved to go around saying just a few years ago, it's easier now to kill a million people than to control a million people. Uh, if that doesn't send shivers down your spine, you're not paying attention. So this is, I mean, this is for all the marbles. This is either where we start taking it into our own hands to start getting out of that system and start interacting with each other so that we become useful and productive to each other, or we just turn to government and say, hey guys, what are you going to do about this? How are you going to save us from this? What kind of food stamp program can you put these displaced workers on? And I think we know how that story is going to end. Well, <laughs> I reported for you this morning on the Morning Monarchy how that story is going, and it doesn't go well when the food stamp electronic benefits don't go through. And that, I think, leads into what we've talked about before, James. It's the Soylent Green scenario. It really, truly is if, if this is that point where it, it goes off in one direction or the other. And we see the little goofy stories that we can kind of laugh at. We'll include in the show notes. And again, everything we mention will always be included in the show notes. Robot escapes testing grounds, disturbs traffic in Russia. Now, this could conjure up all kinds of chaos, but it's a big, goofy-looking round robot that rolled out into the street. And there was never any real danger. And you can look at it and kind of laugh and say, ah, you got to just gotta go back to the drawing board. But those are going to pile up, and they'll pile up. And if you think over the seven years, and especially back towards the beginning of New World Next Week, watch for these drones. They're pretty much going to take over, and they're going to be everywhere. And we saw little funny stories where they would crash, and then it becomes just de rigueur or fait accompli. So you're not allowed to garden, and robots took all our jobs. So let's go to the moon. U.S. draws up rules for commercial moon travel. U.S. government agencies are working on temporary rules to allow a private company to land a spacecraft on the moon next year, 2017, while Congress weighs a more permanent legal framework to govern future commercial missions to the moon, Mars, and other destinations beyond Earth's orbit, officials said. Plans by private companies to land spacecraft on the moon or launch them out of Earth's orbit 
face legal obstacles because the U.S. hasn't put in place regulations to govern space activities. The vaunted 1967 Outer Space Treaty obliges the U.S. and other signatories to authorize and supervise space activities by its non-government entities. But no U.S. agency has authority to regulate commercial space activities outside of rocket launches, spacecraft re-entries into the atmosphere, and operations of telecommunications and remote sensing satellites in Earth orbit, the communication stuff. The issue is coming to a head in part because of a request by Florida-based Moon Express for mission from for permission rather from the U.S. government to land a spacecraft on the moon in 2017. So far, only government agencies have flown satellites beyond Earth's orbit. Other countries are moving faster to establish rules for space launches than the U.S. in compliance with international treaties. Luxembourg last week announced it's partnering with two U.S. companies interested in mining asteroids and set aside $226 million to woo space firms to relocate. The United Arab Emirates also intends to serve as a commercial space haven. So the article does actually note that this would probably be another probability where Americans lose jobs to other countries. We talked about the Space Mining Act back in November of 2015 on this very show. Congress passes Space Mining Act with no growth limits. And again, we see these stories are going to grow and grow and grow. We're going to land something on the moon for space tourism in one year, James. You know, well, I don't know about space tourism quite yet, but certainly for uh, whatever purposes these private companies. They won't say. Yeah, they exactly. They won't say what this mission is. But anyway, I mean, I, I mean, the implications, the ramifications of the choices that are being made here, just, just think about what this ultimately entails. If we start ceding the power to governments to decide who can or cannot go into space for what purposes... That is the power for to control the future of the human species, really. Um, and it's so incredibly important right now. I mean, uh, as, as important as growing vegetables in your front yard is, how many bajillions times more important is it for people who can, who can possibly put together their own private space travel, whatever, to be doing that in full defiance of any treaties or obligations or, or laws that any government presumes to pass on that. It truly is the future of the human species that hangs in the balance here, because if we cede that control to the governments, then the oligarchs now control outer space. And I, I, I think everyone can concede the need for some sort of coordination on in things in, in terms of satellite orbits, I mean, having junk orbiting in space can literally take down satellites and, and things of that nature. So there does need to be some sort of coordination, but to simply cede the power to government to say, you can go to the moon for this, or you can't go to the moon for that. I mean, it's just, we have to stop them from taking that power. And again, the only way to actually stop them from doing it is to do it. So I would hope that there's some non-controlled corporation, uh, unlike Moon Express, that will actually go and do this without seeking approval. That's the situation. So whether it's a garden, just do it. Just maybe in Ohio, they just recently legalized medical marijuana. Just start, grow just start growing it marijuana. It all comes back to Nike for you Oregonians, doesn't it? It does. That's the battle right there. So there's actually new software and a website that shows satellites and space junk circling the Earth in real time. It almost looks like one of those website plugins where it shows you all the visitors that are coming to your website and where other locations are from. There is a lot of satellites and a lot of space junk circling around out there. So again, we'll include the show notes to the flashbacks from the Space Mining Act, but we'll also mention, again, a little bit of good news. Gardens More Powerful Than Presidents is my latest episode of Good News Next Week, plus beating Nestle, which not only we did, again, in Oregon, but they just did it in Pennsylvania as well. And the UK is turning off a lot of CCTV because guess what? They totally don't work at stopping crime. <laughs> Meanwhile, the FBI says U.S. homicide rate at a 51-year low. Murder rate down 49% over a 20-year period. So that's another way that sort of shows you mainstream media wants to sell you chaos, murder, and mayhem and to fall for that and to make all your decisions out of fear. Hopefully you're here watching this because you're done doing that. 
Some of the other stories we're watching using hashtag New World next week. Senate votes for equal slavery for women. One of the last things we discussed on the previous episode of New World next week, where men, even though there's not a draft, have to sign up for the selective service in case they want to have a draft. Now women get that same opportunity. And of course, Hillary is down for it. A couple of questions to leave at the wrap of this episode. Will Israel use another Euro football tournament as a cover for war? And will Brexit happen and a collapse of the EU? And will people just ultimately lose their minds when the summer solstice happens? James, <laughs> we're going to be a bulwark against that in independent, non-commercial alternative media. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not planning to take any much, if any, summer vacation. So I'll be here to document all of that. I've got a, I've got a little bit. 